On the slopes of Mount Parnassus in Greece lies a sacred space, a place where the very air is pregnant with divine power. The ancients believed it to be at the center of the world. Legends say that Zeus, the king of the gods, had let two eagles fly from the opposite ends of the world, and that it was here, over Mount Parnassus, that they crossed paths, above a place called Delphi. You can still walk among the ruins of Delphi's sacred precinct with its great sanctuaries and monuments, and you can still see the stone that marks the meeting point of those two eagles. Preeminent among all these ancient ruins are those of the Temple of Apollo. Here, long ago, the priestess of Apollo, or as she's more commonly known, the Oracle, would commune directly with the god, receiving his prophecy and passing it on to those in need of guidance. If divine wisdom had a home, this was it. Kings and generals and senators and philosophers would travel to the Oracle at Delphi from all over the world, not just Greece, but Rome, Africa, Turkey, and further, Persia, Babylon, even India, to seek the gods' counsel. And as they approached the temple, they might look up at the entrance, upheld by massive columns, and on one of the columns, they would see three instructions carved into the marble and set to come directly from the lips of Apollo himself. The first of these Delphic maxims was comprised of two simple words, two words containing the first commandment from a god to all those seeking deeper insight. Gnothi seauton know yourself. Hello, human. Welcome to Wise Hypocrites Guide to Everything, a podcast about the 10 questions of human existence. I'm Patrick Daniel, a banking lawyer who quit his career to study philosophy and, as a result, unwisely believes himself wise. Hey everyone, this is the first of 10 episodes that will introduce the 10 questions of human existence. These are timeless and universal questions that have defined humanity for tens of thousands of years and that will shape our future for as long as we are human. Basically, every human ever has asked these questions, your entire life consists of these questions, and any serious attempt at making sense of ourselves and the world must address these questions. If you want a fuller introduction to this concept and what engaging with the 10 questions can actually do for you, please check out episode 0, which is the starting point for this series, kind of like a a TV show's pilot. Speaking of episode 0, in that episode I talked about how independently assessing and evaluating and developing our own answers to the 10 questions of human existence is a key step towards our attaining something called self-authorship. And self-authorship is a bit of a tricky concept because it's not very clear to me if it should be described as an ability or a tendency or an aspiration. But in any event, it's what you have when you autonomously direct your life and your actions in accordance with your own values and ideals and goals and etc, etc. Or if we want to really lean into that metaphor a little bit, it's basically saying that in the story of our lives, it is we that are holding the pen. Now, let's assume for a moment that self-authorship is possible, right? And I say let's assume it because I think it warrants a full argument for why it is possible, but this is not the time or place. There's all sorts of questions there. Free will, it's it's a tricky topic. But let's assume for now that self-authorship is possible. Well, one thing I think we can all agree on is that you can't write a good story unless you understand the main character. What do they want? What motivates them? Why do they do the things they do? What makes them the way they are? And that is why our first question is, who am I? This is obviously a question about identity, about what makes us who we are, and also how we see ourselves in uh, relation to the world. And it's also the first question we need to grapple with before we can even start to move on to the others. Consider this. You know how I opened this episode with a reference to the Delphic maxim, know yourself? Well, that maxim, as I mentioned, 
is uh, inscribed at the entrance of the Temple of Apollo at Delphi. Now, this is not just any temple. If you're an ancient Greek, this is not the temple you go to if you're praying for rain or a good harvest or to save your chickens or to get a promotion or for a big victory in battle or whatever. No, the Temple of Apollo at Delphi is specifically where you go to when you're looking for divine wisdom. And the commandment, know yourself, is the very first thing that the God wants you, in your capacity as a seeker of wisdom, as a seeker of knowledge, to keep in mind. You're there looking for wisdom, bam, that's the first thing he hits you with. Now, this alone should tell you something about the centrality of self-knowledge in our quest for understanding. 2,000 years later, the Enlightenment philosopher Jean-Jacques Rousseau, you know, social contract guy, he echoes the same sentiment in the preface to his famous Discourse on Inequality. He says, quote, Of all the branches of human knowledge, the most useful and the least advanced seems to me to be that of man. And I dare say that the inscription on the temple at Delphi alone contained a precept more important and more difficult than all the huge tomes of the moralists. End quote. Basically, Rousseau is saying there's more wisdom in the commandment know yourself than in all the books of moral philosophy. Awesome. It's always great when someone like Rousseau backs you up. But what makes it so important? Why should this question have this primacy compared to all the other big questions? Why does Apollo want me to know this first? Why does the great everything start with who am I? And that's what this episode is about. And one thing we'll see, not just in this episode, but in future ones as well, is that when we start getting serious about asking these questions and following up on their implications, we can end up in some uh, pretty weird places. Who am I? What does it mean, this question? Who am I? Let's look into it. Let's start with something practical, in fact, obvious. You all know the cliche, right? The college kid or the midlife crisis guy, they go off into the wilderness to find themselves, right? Heavy air quotes implied. What do we understand that to mean, this uh, finding themselves? I guess we have this intuition, this feeling, really, that each of us has a purpose, something that we're meant to do, and that it's ultimately our job to figure out what that purpose is. And to find this purpose, we need to figure out what we want, what we really care about, the core of who we really are, stripped of all the bullshit of modern civilization and our families and our dogs and our comic books and, I don't know, whatever it is that surrounds us in our day-to-day -day lives. And once we actually find that core, now we know what we want to do with our lives. And so we return from Thailand and we open a bakery. It's a cliche. It's a cliche, right? But like a lot of cliches, there's some truth to it. As self-authors or aspiring self-authors, we need to have a strong sense of our own identity so that we can make the kinds of choices that are good for us. Right? It's like buying shoes. If you want to buy the right ones, you need to know your size. It's a matter of fit. What kind of life, what kind of job, what kind of career, what kind of partner, what kind of whatever is the right fit for us? So on this view, following Apollo's advice there in Delphi and knowing ourselves means identifying your values, your preferences, your priorities, your beliefs, your tastes, and understanding why you value those things. You know, it's not enough to say, I just like chocolate, or I like Thai food, or I like prog rock. You actually have to understand what it is about you that makes you value those things. And the idea is that this kind of self-knowledge can help you make better decisions and act in ways that are the right fit for you. I'm always reminded, when I think of this, of that film, Citizen Kane. I mean, you know, that film. It's only the greatest film of all time, or at least one of the greatest ones. And if you've never seen Citizen Kane, you have to see Citizen Kane. For those of you who haven't, who might not remember, there's this media mogul, Charles Foster Kane, who's incredibly rich. But he ends up old and full of regrets, having spent his whole life amassing a fortune, but without realizing that what he really longed for was a simple and more innocent life. This guy has spent his whole life chasing a dream that wasn't even his. And when he's dying, with his last breath, he calls out a name, Rosebud. 
And for the whole movie, everyone, executives, people who barely knew him, are trying to figure out who this Rosebud is. Is this a new heiress that nobody had ever heard of? Is this someone who's meant to inherit part of Kane's fortune? But it turns out that Rosebud is none other than the name of Charles Foster Kane's childhood sled. As he was there, dying, all sad and alone in this fantastical mansion, his final thought is to the last time he can remember ever being happy as a child sliding around on the snow with his sled, Rosebud. So Citizen Kane is suggesting that the wrong answer to the question, who am I, can result in a mismatch between what you pursue in life and what you actually value. Or in other words, a mismatch between who you think you are and who you actually are. And maybe not to the dire extreme of Citizen Kane, I think we've all experienced that mismatch. You know, in my old job as a finance lawyer, I was negotiating multi-billion dollar contracts, which sounds amazing, you know, I even put on a voice for it, but the fact is I was miserable. And not because the job itself was bad, but because it just wasn't the right fit. Back then, I didn't know something about myself that I know now. And that is that culture and philosophy matter to me a whole lot more than things like financial reward and the appearance of success. The answer I was giving to the question, who am I, was the wrong answer. And this general concept applies to everyday stuff as well, even when it comes to small fry issues, like ordering at the restaurant, which actually isn't a small fry issue, it's a sacred duty to do that well. Anyway, ordering at the restaurant. If it's not clear to you what your favorite flavor profiles are and which textures you happen to enjoy and why, there's a fair chance that you'll end up picking a dish that you don't like. Does that make sense? When you think about things in these terms, it turns out we're all asking, who am I, thousands of times a day. Every time we consider whether a career choice is a good fit, or whether our partner is the one, or whether our outfit projects the right image, or whether a certain group or ideology or gender or sexuality or ethnicity is or should be a part of our identity. Every time we question our motivations or our goals or our ambitions or what we stand for, every time we wonder about anything that affects the skin we live in, we are asking some version of the question, who am I? Great. Well, that's it then. We're done here. Episode over. You know, all you have to do is find your purpose, your true north, your rosebud or whatever. Uh, take some green tea with all that self-actualization and uh, you will live a happy and fulfilled life. Except, no. Look, don't get me wrong, this kind of self-helpish approach that I've just outlined for the past few minutes is useful. But the work doesn't stop there. There are deeper questions, more philosophical questions that are tucked away deep within who am I? And that doesn't mean that because they're tucked away and they're maybe a bit more mysterious and esoteric, that they're any less relevant to how we live our day-to-day -day lives. If we really want to live examined lives, we can't be superficial. We have to deal with these deeper questions. And one more conceptual reason that who am I should be the first question we grapple with is that you have to know yourself before you can know anything. In Plato's dialogue, Phaedrus, Socrates says that he doesn't have an answer to philosophical questions because, quote, I am not yet able, as the Delphic inscription has it, to know myself. So I find it ridiculous when I don't know that yet to investigate irrelevant things, end quote. So the way Socrates seems to be interpreting Apollo's commandment to know yourself is that self-knowledge is a precondition for other types of knowledge. Let's explore that. Let's talk about you for a minute. The most immediately obvious thing about yourself to yourself is that you exist in the first person. If you look around yourself right now, you'll notice that all the people and objects that you see, they're kind of like out there. Whereas you are kind of like a feeling of meanness in here. And that feeling is located somewhere behind your eyes at the center of everything else. Now, you are at the center. All those other people and things, 
They're around you. Notice that. Everything is centered on you. Even if you stand up and you walk around, you still stay at the center of everything. It's almost as though the whole world was structured around you. Which, I mean, isn't that an amazing coincidence? This is to say that you are first and foremost a center of experience. A point where subjective consciousness happens. And from that first person perspective, everything that happens, happens around and in relation to you. And you'll notice that, try as you will, you can't switch from that perspective. Because you don't just have a point of view, you are a point of view. For all intents and purposes, you are the whole world from that point of view. Your whole universe, anything you can see, touch, feel, know, is the universe as filtered through a single unique instrument for experiencing that is you. So you need to really get to know that instrument and how it works, right? Kind of like how a scientist needs to understand their instruments in order to be able to interpret the data they're seeing. Imagine a scientist who doesn't know how a microscope works, right? And they're just sitting there looking at a bunch of bacteria under the microscope and they don't know that the microscope is blowing up the image to, I don't know, a thousand times the actual size. I mean, they wouldn't know what they're looking at. They think that they're staring at like monsters or, or giant cockroaches whipping their flagella about. I, I don't know what a bacterium actually looks like, but you know, probably not a cockroach. But the point is, you need to understand the instrument to understand how it's affecting what you're seeing. You need to understand the instrument to interpret the data. And similarly, you need to understand yourself in order to understand how you being you affects your perception of the outside world. Because if you don't, you're kind of like someone who lives their whole life wearing purple lenses but doesn't know it, and so thinks the whole world is purple. And you're like that. You're wearing lenses all the time. They're not purple lenses, but they're you lenses. You might never be able to take off these you lenses, but you still want to know how they work. Because you want to know how these lenses affect your perception of the world, your interpretation of the world. You want to know how your you lenses distort the world. There's a big difference between believing well, the world is purple and believing, well, the world seems purple to me, but let's take that with a pinch of salt. So if the only world you can access is the world as perceived by and through you, self-knowledge is the only possible kind of knowledge. Maybe this is what the 16th century French philosopher Michel de Montaigne was getting at when he wrote, quote, I study myself more than any other subject. That is my metaphysics, that is my physics, end quote. Now, I don't think we should interpret this as Montaigne boasting. You know, he's not arrogantly saying that he's some super interesting topic of study as me. Think of the words he's using. I am my own physics. I am my own metaphysics. Well, what are physics and metaphysics? They're the disciplines that study the nature of reality. And he's comparing the study of himself to these disciplines. I take this to mean that there's a whole universe within ourselves, a whole universe to explore that only we have access to. But that's not all. Perhaps that universe within ourselves is all we have access to. This is a very interesting concept, that we can't access anything other than that universe of consciousness, of experience within ourselves. If we take this idea seriously, then we're back to the notion that to know the external world, we have to know ourselves first because we are the tool, the instrument, through which the external world gets perceived and interpreted and understood. So what Montaigne seems to be saying here is that his understanding of reality itself flows through his understanding of himself. If Montaigne is right, what does it mean to know yourself in this sense? It means familiarizing yourself with your own consciousness, with the sensation of being from the inside of yourself. And there are many practical ways you can do this. Some forms of meditation are a great way to get started on this specific enterprise. On the more theoretical level, it means also grappling with the mystery of consciousness from a philosophical point of view, and why physical processes in the brain should give rise to all the subjective sensations of being. But it also means learning to recognize the structures of our own thinking, the concepts through which we understand and interpret the world, the cognitive and psychological mechanisms that underlie our experience, trying to understand our own impulses, our motivations, our biases and our privilege and why we act in certain ways. 
why we see the world in certain ways. So we're talking engaging a bit with psychology and philosophy of mind and so on. Which, by the way, brings us to our next point. Because while so far we've been talking more about who am I in terms of identifying my own unique views and preferences and so on, who am I as distinct from others, now we've moved on to the structure and functioning of the mind, which is something that we presumably share with other people. So let's add another layer to this uh, self-knowledge lasagna that we're putting together here. Because we don't want to forget that the picture we're trying to paint here isn't just a self-portrait. We're trying to paint a picture of humanity as a whole. Maybe the question we really should be asking isn't who am I, but who are we? Montaigne wrote that, quote, each of us bears the whole stamp of the human condition, end quote. And this is a concept that is built upon by other philosophers, such as uh, Thomas Hobbes, state of nature guy, who tells us, and I paraphrase, that whoever looks into themselves and thinks about what they're doing when they think and have an opinion or when they reason or when they hope and when they fear, etc., and on what grounds, they will get better knowledge about the thoughts and passions of other people on similar occasions. So basically, he's saying that by exploring ourselves, we're also looking to gain valuable insight into the grand question of what it means to be human. And that matters too, right? I know it's philosophical and theoretical, but it matters practically because understanding other people, even if only by reference to ourselves and how we think, can help us put ourselves in their shoes. It can improve our capacity for communication, our compassion, and our empathy. And there's nothing that's more practical than that. These are real-life traits that we want to have in order to be, well, to be better humans, frankly. But also, say that you're a person who has a vision for society. And I'm not just talking, you know, you're a politician or the leader of a social enterprise or a company that deals in these kind of things. Even just as a private individual, with strong views about what it means to be a good citizen. Today, that vision that you have must take into account that we live in a pluralistic world. Our horizons are global. And that means that unless your vision for society is designed to be tribalistic, you know, to only apply to this or that group of people, then your vision has to, in principle, be capable of being accepted by people with very different points of view. To do that, you kind of need to grasp what it is that we all have in common as human beings. If I want green lady and blue guy to sign up to the same deal, I need to find the point on which they can converge and say, okay, we share this. You know, there have been various thinkers that believe that we are inherently social or political animals, and that this means that we can't really make sense of ourselves without considering that broader context of humanity as a whole. And if that's the case, it's not just, as Hobbes says, that by understanding ourselves, we understand humanity. It's actually more the case that by understanding humanity, we understand a little more about ourselves. Fine. So, now we know that who am I is the fundamental question for figuring out our place in life, for understanding how we process data about the external world, and also for finding out what connects us all as human beings. Fantastic. Know yourself is really starting to look like great advice. But I want to close this episode on the flip side to all this. Because there's always a flip side, right? You know, we are, after all, philosophers, you and I. So let's look at the flip side. The problem is this. Answers to the question, who am I, tend to take the form of definitions. I am Patrick. I am a lawyer. This is how my mind works. This is what human nature is. This is who I am. You see the problem? And no, it's not that I'm special and unique and you can't define me. Although, in a way, it kind of is. The way I phrase it is this. We are never just one thing. Yet, these defining characteristics, these labels, can get us thinking that we are just one thing. And that can make us resistant to the parts of ourselves that don't strictly fit whatever label we've applied to ourselves. But there's an even bigger problem, very closely related, that I was alluding to, and that is the problem of change. Let me ask you, 
Are you the same person you were as a child? Or 10 years ago? Or even last year? Because I know I'm not. My appearance has changed, you know, all my hair has fallen out, many of my views have changed, I don't have the same priorities or preferences I used to have, etc. Right? We are all constantly changing, evolving moment to moment. There's um, this absolutely wonderful ancient Greek philosopher called Heraclitus. Heraclitus the Obscure is uh, what he's known as. And he talks about how everything flows, pantare in the ancient Greek, uh, everything is in constant flux. And he has this rather famous aphorism that you can't step into the same river twice. The point here is that the waters flow. So by the time you stepped into the river once, the river has changed. The river you stepped into is gone forever. And we're kind of like that too. And if you think of it, literally 98% of your atoms changes from year to year. How's that for constant flux? So say you come up with an answer to who am I. Without knowing it, you're actually limiting yourself. You've stuck a label on yourself that might not even be accurate anymore. And yet you're still acting it out. And, you know, it's kind of comfortable. It gives you these nice, easy-to-follow guidelines. Oh, I'm the kind of person who does X. And so you just keep doing X uh, to keep up with that self-image. But all the while, you're changing. You're in flux. And soon enough, there's going to be a gap between who you think you are and who you actually feel like. Congrats, you've just maneuvered yourself into another rosebud situation. Check out this amazing quote by the philosopher Ben Senonai, Hungarian guy. And as context, he's referring to Apollo's commandment at Delphi to know yourself. Quote, Knowing thyself is an obstacle to acknowledging and making peace with constantly changing values. If you know thyself to be such and such a kind of person, this limits your freedom considerably. You might have been the one who chose to be an espresso person or a donating to charity person. But once these features are built into your self-image, you have very little say in what direction your life is going. Any change would either be censored or lead to cognitive dissonance. As André Gide wrote in Autumn Leaves, quote, A caterpillar who seeks to know himself would never become a butterfly. End quote. But maybe you think about it a little and you say, okay, but surely underneath all these changes, it's still you, right? I mean, you can become more or less tall, have more or less hair, eat more or less red meat, but all these changes are still happening to you. There's this core that is a constant through time and that makes you you, no matter how much your qualities change. Well, that sounds good, except this core you doesn't really seem to be anywhere. In fact, most mainstream scientists, neuroscientists specifically, psychologists and philosophers are skeptical that it even exists. I mean, think about it. What would it even be, this core self that remains unchanging while all your properties and qualities change in time? What would it be? A soul? Does this mean that if I want to believe that I am a single thing, I have to believe in a soul? That's quite a lot to buy into. That's quite a metaphysical commitment. Like, like, I want to believe in a self, and so I have to believe in a soul? That's a lot. Unless, of course, you're already a Christian, or you belong to some other faith where belief in a soul is already contemplated. So if you already believe in a soul, then okay, congratulations, you got yourself a self. What does everyone else think? Take Buddhists, for instance, possibly the most thorough students of the self. They too are skeptical. They have this whole concept, anatta, or non-self, is this idea that a permanent self is merely an illusion. Well then what could we be, if not a self? Here's a hypothesis. Perhaps all we are is experience itself, a tiny slice of the universe that has attained consciousness and that as a result thinks of itself as a separate self, but isn't. But hey, that's just me. No idea what the rest of you are. You know, this is actually quite interesting, just as an aside. It's something that I found quite often in my journey studying philosophy, is that there's all sorts of things around us that we take for granted, and that once you pull at the thread, they kind of unravel. When you take a concept or an idea or a thought, and you look at it closely and you start to pull at the threads, quite often you realize the thing you thought you were looking at isn't there. I mean, here we're literally asking the question, who am I? And we're starting to see the possibility that I is not actually a thing at all. We talked about human nature earlier, but isn't that just some arbitrary concept that we came up with? That 
more often than not, has actually been used to exclude and dehumanize those who didn't quite fit the definition? Well, God damn, there's no such thing as a self, and human nature is a sham, and we keep changing. I mean, what is it we're even looking for here? It sounds like this whole question is just bullshit. To which I say, welcome to the frustrations of philosophy, friend, where there's never answers, but only more questions. And it's also the reason you've never seen a philosopher who didn't look like they were 65. But all jokes aside, I know how you feel. I know how you feel, and so does anyone who's ever studied philosophy. But it's not bullshit. It sounds like it is, but it's not. It's not bullshit because, well, first of all, we're asking it in every moment of our lives. And so whatever we feel about it, we have to deal with it, and we have to deal with it intelligently. But it's also not bullshit because exploring this question can and does reveal something interesting about ourselves, something that is worth knowing. What is bullshit is expecting that at the end of this journey, there's a neat gift-wrapped answer, a clear and final definition of who I am, and that once you've found that answer, that's it. You can just relax and your work is done. Not so easy. So, let's wrap it all up. Originally, I was going to end this episode with a little spiel about how self-knowledge is our way of finding our place in the world, of achieving comfort in our own skin, and a mastery of self. And it's true. A huge part of why this question matters so much is our doing our best to understand what makes each of us unique and interesting and cultivating those things. But also understanding what we all have in common and seeking to promote understanding of each other as co-participants in this human experience. But the more I think about it, the more I think that the real moral here, if there is a moral, is about getting comfortable with being nothing. Remember Apollo's temple at Delphi? Well, Plato tells us a story that once upon a time, a friend of Socrates went to the oracle at Delphi to ask her, is there any man wiser than Socrates? And the oracle said no. Now, Socrates was amazed by this. After all, you know, he spent his whole lifetime saying that he knows nothing, right? That's a famous thing Socrates says, that he knows nothing. And it's not just modesty, this is a big part of his philosophy, that we cannot really know anything for certain, and that big philosophical questions usually don't yield answers, but just confusion. So Socrates is curious now, and he sets out to investigate what the oracle meant when she said, no man is wiser than Socrates. And at the end, he seems to settle with this. Other people know nothing, but they don't know that they know nothing. Socrates, on the other hand, knows nothing, but he also knows that he knows nothing. And that's not nothing. So maybe this is what makes him wiser, or more precisely, less ignorant than others. So if we go along with Socrates' intuition, and we should always do that, the oracle, who, let's not forget, is the spokesperson for the god, is saying that the wisest man in the world knows nothing, but if you're seeking wisdom, you have to know yourself. Sounds like a paradox. Unless you put those two things together and what you end up with sounds a little like this. To know yourself is to know that there is nothing there to know. Okay, well in that case, who am I? Maybe the answer is nothing. Or rather, no thing. Not an object. Not an entity with defined qualities. Not a thing. But a process. An event unfolding through time. Now, I realize this can sound scary and weird, but actually, it's kind of comforting because it means you can still say, I am a person who values this or who does that, but that's no longer a fixed definition. It's merely a statement of your present state of being. A little like saying I'm feeling hungry or sleepy or sad or joyful. None of these things defines you. They're just who you are in that moment. You don't have a sacred duty to live your life according to this or that definition or label where any failure to do so is your failure to live up to your identity. Because your identity is not fixed, but like Heraclitus' river, fluid and undefinable. You're like a set of doors open to endless possibilities, endless identities and experiences you can have and connections you can make. Because when you think about it, being nothing is a lot like being everything.
Hey, humans, thank you for sticking with me until the end of this episode. I know it must have been tough. Anyway, the gods of the internet have ordained that one must always end these things with a little bit of self-promotion. So, much to my distaste, I'm going to try and do it because, well, you know, you just gotta do what you gotta do. So, here we go. If you like what I'm doing here, you can always help out, and most of the ways you can do that don't involve you sending me wads of cash in an envelope, which of course I'm always grateful to receive. But if you don't want to send me envelopes with or without cash in them, you can really, really help in other ways. The main way is to leave a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever else you listen to your podcast and that allows you to leave podcast reviews. Now, here's the thing. The review doesn't even have to be a good review. There's something about algorithms. I don't know how it works. But the point is, you can actually write, Patrick is an idiot, the podcast is shit, and that still works in my favor. So, well, hey, it's a miracle. Try it. Otherwise, you can share the podcast on your social media. You can talk about it. You can spread the word and help build the community. Because community is a very important thing here. What I need most to help further my project is to hear from you. I want to hear your lived experiences. The whole point is to show how these big questions really matter to our everyday lives, not just if you want to appreciate Shakespeare or the Aeneid or Mozart or some philosopher. What matters most is how you relate to these questions and how they pop up in your lives. So if you have any thoughts and questions about any of this, send me an email at patrick at wisehypocrite.com. Or you can leave a voicemail on Anchor, anchor anchor.fm slash wisehypocrite. And if you have a question or a voicemail there that I really like, I'm going to stick it in the podcast. Well, hey, you're going to be famous. (laughs) Not really, but still, you know, I will stick it on the podcast, probably. And here's a new thing. Recently, I've been spending a lot of time on Clubhouse. Clubhouse is an amazing app to have live audio conversations with people. And there I have a club called Existential, where I talk about exactly the kinds of questions that we discuss on this podcast. So if you're on Clubhouse, add me at Wise Hypocrite. Or if you're not on Clubhouse and need an invite, reach out to me some way and I will send you one. Otherwise, you can find me on all the social media at Wise Hypocrite, all of it, except for Twitter. I mean, I'm technically on Twitter, but I hate it because it drives people crazy, so I'm never really on it. Finally, last but not least, if you want to help me out in a more material way, which I am immensely grateful for, of course, you know, I do all of this by myself and for free, uh, you can sign up to my Patreon. Wise Hypocrite, of course, and you can get access to all the bonus content, which for now is mainly Clubhouse conversations that I record, my interviews with authors and philosophers and scientists there, but also just extra stuff and previews and promotions, and of course, my undying gratitude. You know, every little helps. As I say, this is completely free, but with a bit of extra income, I'm going to be able to hire a team to help with frequency so I can do more episodes and not be as slow as I am currently. I'm going to be able to get equipment so that the sound gets better. It's just going to be a better product. Eventually, I'm going to get to it out of my own pocket, so don't worry. But of course, if you want to chip in, I would really love it if you did. Otherwise, thank you so much for listening to all of this nonsense, and uh, I will catch you again very soon. Arrivederci. Arrivederci.